Hello everyone, uh, my name is Chris Hart and I work for Manchester University Press and I'm delighted that you're joining us for what promises to be an excellent book launch for Manchester Something Rich and Strange, uh, which published this week. Tonight's stellar panel uh, includes Sarah Butler, Paul Dobsturak, Paul I hope I've pronounced that correctly, if not please correct me, the editors of the book and contributors Peter Callow, Morag Rose and Nick Dunn. So everyone at the press is excited about bringing you today's event, but before we jump in, I'd like to do some housekeeping. So firstly, thank you to everyone who's tuned in and is watching this live and interactive book launch. Uh, on your screen, you should see an event dashboard containing the option to raise questions. This is for you to type questions throughout the talk, which the panel will hopefully get around to answering in the Q&A section at the end of the event. Please do ask questions because from the events we've already done, I know that authors uh, really appreciate this interaction with the audience. So just to add a few acknowledgements of my own, I'd like to say a big thank you to the panel for participating tonight. It's great to be finally doing this event. I also want to say that Manchester University Press is delighted to be the publisher of this excellent new book. Not only is it a great book uh, that has introduced us to a number of new authors, but I've also seen the positive message on social media. And I love the fact that the book has given us the opportunity to work with a lot of Manchester based uh, people, including the photographer, Not Quite Light, whose photograph I don't to cover, as well as publications like Manchester Confidential, I Love Manchester, and Manchester Review of Books, who have kindly given positive coverage to the book. And lastly, the People's History Museum Bookshop, who are our partner for tonight's event. Uh, it makes it feel like a very Manchester-centred book. Uh, just to add finally, that if you don't already have a copy of the book, or if you do and you are thinking about getting hold of more copies as Christmas presents, maybe to those who are unfortunate enough not to live in Manchester, please do consider buying copies through the People's History Museum Bookshop. A link on how to order copies through the bookshop will be sent out in an email following this event. And I, I hope you agree with me that supporting local bookshops is an important thing to do during these challenging times. So that's it from me. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to Sarah and Paul. Thanks, Grace. Um, welcome, everyone. It's lovely to see you here. Um, just a quick word on how we're going to run tonight's event. So um, Paul and I are just going to speak for about five minutes each just to introduce the book and the context and a little bit about ourselves. Um, and then we're going to hang over, hand over to our brilliant panellists, um, Nick, Morag and Peter, and that we've asked them to talk for about five minutes. So I think that'll be a mix of kind of, of talking about the book, but also reading um, some of their work from the book. Um, and then we'll move into questions and answers. So if you have questions and answers as you go, do feel free to um, post them in the question box. Um, yeah, and I hope you enjoy it. I'll hand over, over to Paul. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I'm just trying to find my screen share. So I was going to share a few images. Where's it gone? Um, Paul, so two seconds. I'll have to go. Just bear with me one second. Just hang on. Uh, okay. I'm not sure what's happened to the presentation images. Bear with there, with, oh. there you go. You should get a message through now offering you to share your screen. Perfect. Yeah, I've got it. I just am um, trying to find the images now. Because you can see my desktop, which is not what I want you to see. Um, I'm going to have to do it like this. Apologies. Okay, uh, apologies for that. So I, I wanted to speak tonight about, I guess, my side of the story of this book and, and kind of broadly what it, what it aims to do. So um, I've lived in Stockport now for 10 years. And before that, my home was Oxford for eight years. And, and these are two places that could not be more different. So moving up here to the post-industrial north was for me like entering a new world, away from what had become for me a really oppressive sense of middle-class conformism in Oxford, um, to something more freer, more open and rich with potential. So it's hard to put your finger on what that is in Manchester. Maybe it's its peculiar geography. Yeah, the immense bowl of land 
between high hills, somewhere in the Peak District, but one, one here from uh, near Disney. This kind of brings wildness to the very door of the city. Maybe it's the climate, the seemingly relentless rain that Sarah and I dwell on in the introduction to the book. But I think it's ultimately, um, it's the people. There's a kind of oft repeated characteristic of the North, friendliness mixed with a no-nonsense no attitude, attitude mixed with a kind of bravura. So in 2016, after I'd lived here for six years, I made the decision to try and walk the entirety of Greater Manchester to get to know places near and far, and try and discover what, if anything, gives this urban region its identity. So over two years, 400 miles and over 12,000 photographs later, I'm still not sure. Is it the unmistakable brick monoliths that were once cotton mills? The endless long rows of terraced housing that you find everywhere in the urban region. Warehouses, both grand and mundane. Or civic buildings, such as town halls. Or maybe even underground spaces, sewers and tunnels, connecting up the city and the wider region. All the images that I'm showing you very briefly here are from the website that I created out of photographs taken on these many walks. Uh, which I call the Stones of Manchester. Now, many of the photographs in the book come from that project, and the book tries to achieve something of the same expansiveness as that photography project, but in words, to explore the city in writing. So the 60 words that form the basis for the individual pieces were chosen by the writers themselves, but I think all speak of some distinct facet of the urban region uh, that is Greater Manchester. So for example, in the seas, we have canal, car wash, chimney, cloister, clough, cobble, co-op, corridor, and cotton. We've arranged these words into 11 larger themes. And I think as a whole, the aim was to really sort of challenge us, challenge readers to think anew about what and also who gives Manchester its identity, right from the city centre to the fringes of the urban region. There's a broad motivation underlying the book's emphasis on diversity. We all know that the centre of the city, uh, both Manchester and Salford, are undergoing frenetic redevelopment dozens of towers, of offices and apartments. And as, as we all know as well, the virtually none, if any, of these uh, this building is classed as affordable. It's not accessible to the vast majority of people who already live in Greater Manchester. So we, the writers of this book, want a more inclusive city. We want the rich diversity of desires all across Manchester to be celebrated and brought together, to make places, to create places that work for everyone, and not just a few of the wealthy and powerful. And I think words are just as important as actions in this regard. With all the money and other resources being funneled into the urban core, there's an unprecedented opportunity to use this abundant circuit for the greater public good, something that is clearly not happening at the moment. But this uh, route requires a kind of vision of the city as something complex, something diverse, disturbing, contradictory even. I mean, stark contrast, I think, to the slick sound bites that are so beloved of Manchester's uh, marketeers. So I'll hand over to Sarah now, who will continue introducing the book. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'm Sarah Butler, um, Paul's co-editor on um, Manchester Something Rich and Strange. And I was born in St Mary's Hospital in, on Oxford Road in Manchester and grew up in Stockport. I moved away for university and stayed away for 16 years before returning in 2012. And I remember talking about coming home but realising once I got here that I didn't really know Manchester anymore. I changed, it had changed. And so for the last eight years, I've been refinding Manchester and remaking my relationship with it. So working on Manchester Something Rich and Strange has been a real pleasure and privilege because it's immersed me even more deeply in the complexities of this city I call home. I want to pick up on what Paul has just said about words and language. So I'm a novelist and my second novel, Before the Fire, is set in Manchester in the summer of the riots of 2011. 
And in 2018, I published a novella, Not Home, written in conversation with people living in unsupported temporary accommodation in East Manchester. I've always been a believer in the power of stories to affect change in people's minds and hearts, in their decisions and in the stories they then go on to tell. This idea that how we imagine cities, how we write them, speak them, dream them, matters, matters, lies at the heart of Manchester something rich and strange. Words and stories have agency, and the richer and more diverse these, those stories are, the better for our city. The book could be described perhaps as fragmentary with its 11 themes and 60 word-led chapters, and yet we feel that this fragmentation reflects how we as individuals and communities experience cities. Our hope is that the book creates resonances across themes, across divides. We hope it inspires new imaginations and new stories and helps create a stronger, more inclusive city region. And I wanted to just share a short extract from one of my own pieces from the book, which was originally commissioned for a project called Stories from the Road, a collaboration with the University of Manchester's Urban Institute. Um, and it's a collection of stories, and I interviewed a lot of people, um, about specific places on Oxford Road and what they meant to them. Um, so it's a collection of stories from a wide range of voices and then I wrote this piece kind of inspired by those stories. Um, so it's called, it reflects on the part of Manchester Oxford Road called The Corridor. There are no lines telling you where it starts and where it ends, so let's draw them in. Two trails of coloured chalk across the tarmac, here from park to shops, here from library to hotel. Let's make them both the beginning. This is, after all, a place where things start. Life, adulthood, careers, love affairs, ideas. My own entrance into the world amongst them on a snowy Thursday morning, April 1978. Let's make them both the end. Things come and go, after all. Dingy clubs and office blocks, bridges and grand plans, all that dust. The busiest bus route in Europe, they say, thousands shuttling from stop to stop, forever changing their collection of strangers. Amongst them, bikes weave their own solitary patterns along the road, and the cars, and the taxis, and the people who walk. You never step in the same corridor twice. Under the bridges, everything is amplified, the slap echo of a manhole not quite flush with the tarmac, the stink of traffic fumes, the lack of somewhere to sleep the colour grey. Free books, pizza, burrito, noodles, theatre ticket, plug adapter, memories, cheap veg, a place to go, guitar string, lamkahari, family swim, concerto, americano, chameleon, knowledge, music, prayer, pre-love jumper, haircut, bank loan, fertility treatment, contemporary art, trees. A line into and out of the city, a place of beginnings and middles and ends, a string of and then, and then, and then. Except nothing will stay in place. In August it sleeps, come September it's frenetic. In the early hours the nighttime stragglers do -si do with street cleaners, delivery vans, early shift workers. There are no lines telling you where it starts and where it ends, so let's draw them in. Two trails of coloured chalk across the tarmac, here from hotel to library, here from shops to park. A beginning and an end, an end and a beginning, all this life and dust in between. So we're really excited to have three of the book's contributors with us here this evening. Um, Peter Kalu, Morag Rose and Nick Duns. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, we've asked each of them to speak for about five minutes and share some extracts from the book and their own thoughts and experiences in Manchester. Um, and after their contributions, we'll open up the floor for questions. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Pete, who I think is going to introduce our first speaker. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, I will. Uh, so Nick, Nick Dunn is going to speak first. Nick is executive director of Imagination, which is an open exploratory design research lab uh, based at Lancaster University, where Nick's a professor of urban design. Nick was born in Salford and now lives in Manchester, and his work responds directly to the contemporary city which he explores through experimentation and writing on the nature of urban space. Nick is a prolific writer. He's published numerous books on architecture and urbanism, including The Wonderful Dark Matters, published in 2016, which is a really a love letter to 
nocturnal Manchester and Salford and his own nighttime walks in the Twin Cities. So over to you, Nick. Thank you, Paul, and hello, everyone. Well, just before I read a short extract from one of my pieces in the book, I just wanted to talk a little bit around that. I mean, right now we live in a world in which many different things appear far less certain than perhaps they did in previous times. But I think this also resonates with the identity of Manchester. For me, this book, Manchester, Something Rich and Strange, is wonderful because of the many different voices it contains. Being the birthplace of so many different political movements, scientific discoveries, cultural forces and influential figures, it rightly lays claim as an important place. But it is also a city of latent energies, more clandestine histories and secrets. Outside of the big narratives the city tells about itself are alternative readings and stories that I feel are equally significant. So I think this book is valuable, not because I'm in it, um, but because it enables some of these alternative stories to come to the surface and be shared. So just now I'm going to read you a part of one of my pieces for the book, which is called Ring Road. The M60, the Manchester Outer Ring Road, is a thing of wonder. 36 miles that form the UK's only circular motorway. That were it not for its 27 junctions, could be an infinite loop of Ballardian lust for drivers. An orbital motorway that stitches together the various districts and communities within its concrete ring and provides a significant force field for those beyond it. I was one of those. Born in Salford, but quickly dispatched to Boothstown, then Tilsley. The respective postcodes of M28 and M29 seeming to echo the dis increasing distance from the centre of things. Formative memories were visiting my paternal grandparents in Ermston, who happened to be called Jack and Vera. Being the same names as Manchester's then most famous couple from the TV soap Coronation Street has always seemed to raise a wry smile when they are mentioned in conversation. The journey was particularly spectacular from the back seat of the car joining at junction 13 in Worsley, heading southbound, our family car suddenly elevated from the humdrum 30 miles per hour limits of suburbia into the fast flow of the motorway. As the two lanes to the left quickly peeled away, providing exits for the M602 and the M62, our two lane, subsequently widened, ribbon of infrastructure shot forward and up in the air like a whip crack of asphalt. Ascending the Barton High Level Bridge, the bonnet of my dad's gold 14er became resplendent even in the Dumplington Merc as the anticipation of briefly being above everything, a highway in the sky, was giddying. Then the descent. This is arguably the most epic part of the M60, which like the city itself has been brought together from a patchwork of different elements and identities. Manchester tells a great story about itself, forming a coherent narrative from disjointed bits and pieces. But here, especially on a sunny day, Manchester briefly becomes Los Angeles, as sleek concrete curves take you into the sky and towards the city of dreams. However, rather like those who seek their destiny in Hollywood, the M60 can never take you to Manchester but instead enables you to circumnavigate it, going round and round, always on the edge, never quite inside, always full of promise, but somehow always in the distance too. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, that was beautiful. Um, so I'm gonna introduce Morag. I'm just gonna find her. Um, okay, so Morag's an artist um, and academic an activist and an anarcho flaneurs I hope I've pronounced that the way you like it pronounced, Mark. Um, she worked in, she worked in the voluntary sector across Greater Manchester for 15 years before completing her PhD, Women Walking Manchester, Desire Lines Through the Original Modern City at the University of Sheffield in 2018. In 2006, Morag founded Manchester 
psychogeographical collective, the Loiterers Resistance Movement, um, which is known as LRM, and has performed, presented and exhibited widely. She's a lecturer in human geography at the University of Liverpool, a member of the Walking Artists Network, and is currently working on a number of publications. Her interests include promoting, protecting and promoting public space, accessible architecture, creative mischief making, Americana music, and Doctor Who. Thanks for joining us, Morag. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to read uh, from my chapter Spirit because it's really the story of my um, dirty, passionate, complex love for this city. So. The spirit is dying, the soul is being lost. I hear this constant lament about Manchester and occasionally when all I can see are constellations of cranes juxtaposed with cries of suffering, I feel it too. There's a growing revulsion at the spectacle, a despair at the narrowing of potentials and the closing down of our stories. It's smoothing, sanitizing, suffocating market scam of regeneration, killing something special, something somehow authentic. It's a fear of powerlessness in a city dominated by capital. Every space, pure money, privatisation, securitisation, enclosure, stealing our common treasury. It's the banshee wail every time a piece of our heritage is lost or another dull tower goes up. The litany, Pomona, Turner Street, Library Walk, Ancoats Dispensary, and so very many more. But what does it really mean? What are we actually losing? What is this essence of Manchester? Given shape in popular culture, it's usually a swaggering cliche of rain or football or Corrie's cobbles or blokes, always blokes with guitars, rough diamonds, working hard, partying harder. A civic symbol of the bee has unified in times of strife, bringing comfort and solidarity. It's been recuperated and co-opted now, co now, so it's mandatory on every bus, fridge magic, magnet and rubbish bin. Repetition can't erase our love, but it can warp it when viewed from outside. I've always have had my doubts about its multiple meanings anyway. For me, our forefathers, they were fathers, wanted worker drones, not mutual cooperation. I believe the reality is so much more beautiful, chaotic and diverse than a single genius loci can handle. How can there ever be a symbol that encompasses all this? I've lived here 20 years now, 22 actually, and now I'm more convinced than ever that essentialism is a dangerous thing. We need to embrace an openness, a multiplicity of Manchesters that are all particular, non-exceptional. And I think the book actually is, is part of this. We're all interconnected beyond our own narratives, part of a bigger tapestry. The late Doreen Massey, herself a Mancunian, whose ideas helped shape modern geography, articulates this perfectly. Her vision of a network of relationships, always attentive to power, always open to change, a multiplicity of stories so far. We can change the outcome of those stories our stories, but we need to acknowledge how we got where we are now. Recently, I was walking with a friend, not so recently now, I'm sorry to say, she was telling me how much she loved the red brick mills and warehouses that characterise our architecture and the first industrial revolution. Her love was ambivalent because she knew they were built on exploitation. She told me about visions of blood pouring out of walls, and yet the allure of the city still transfixes us. Together, we stood on a corner near Shootill bus station an accidental confluence of the city's past and present. The Arndale Centre, a wine bar commemorating the Scuttlers, a brutal Victorian gang, a cherished scrap of wasteland colonised by flowers she named for me, a soon to be evicted community space and the edge of the Northern Quarter. Rambo's tattoos and exotic, pe exotic piercings, its dilapidated signs long a source of absurd joy. Dare to be different. Take that, Manchester United, the entire Australian rugby team, stars of Brookside and many more. Fresh needles for every client. Those were the days. And of course, to our left, the bus station, people leaving, arriving, the ebb and flow and bargain travel of the network city. Which of these Manchesters is more real, more true? Where is our city's abiding? In my kitchen, there's a bottle of slow gin, fruit picked from the green down the road, nourished by earth, but I don't think it's in there. Perhaps it's getting closer, imbibing our terroir can't say that word, sorry. The shelf the liquor sits on is in a ramshackle Georgian terrace in a suburb from a song, What Do You Get For Your Troubles and Pain? A rented room in Wally Range. That's at the heart of my Manchester and its crumbling walls have been central to my intense and ambivalent love affair with the city. When I arrived here, I was fleeing from rather than running to. A toss of a coin brought me here and I didn't imagine staying more than six months. 
lost and alone, I stumbled into a housing co-op, which became both my sanctuary and an incubator, a home. I was luckier than I realised. Does anyone really know when fortune shines on us? Because this house had more heart, more stories than I could ever have dreamt. On the wall, above where I sit writing, there's a large enamel sign. I missed that sign during lockdown when I was not here. Salvage from a cellar, it proclaims this was the residence of James Kite, N-A-T-M. It displays a phone number we traced to the early 20th century, and in particular that time between the wars when paranormal phenomena, alternative therapies and spiritualism were fashionable passions. This street had been grand once, toll booth at the end, remembered in the name of Brooks Bar, bus stop. Later, a time of bed sits and bad reputations as fortunes waned, fashion changed, and Kite's paraphernalia languished on love. He had boasted of lady assistance and administered wonders such as diathermy, ionization, and sunray treatment. Light was a cure for a range of childhood maladies in the rainy city and a restor restorative cure for many ills. Patients wore goggles and little else as they absorbed those magical rays. Quackery suspected right from the start with concerns about possible carcinogenic effects of direct exposure to sunlight. A few Christmases ago, some women knocked on our front door. They had occupied our house in the 1970s and had stories of squats, placard making and births in my bedroom. They recalled renovating the building to create a community and they told us about an object discovered under our kitchen floorboards. Their preliminary research had suggested it was an ectoplasm machine, the kind used during seances to give the illusion of a manifestation or a possession. Perhaps Mr Kite conjured apparitions too, gave comfort to the people he exploited, an entertaining fraudster or a dangerous charlatan, depending on your taste. Perhaps his wraiths were as authentic as any other that claimed to be the spirit of Manchester. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Maura. That was wonderful um, and moving as well. I think there's so much in this book that seems to belong to a different era now in terms of what we're living through at the moment. Um, maybe that's something we can come to with, with questions. So our, our final panellist tonight is Peter Carlu. Uh, Peter writes short stories in styles ranging from the realist to the surreal to the carnivalesque and also he's written science fiction as well so Lickshot I've read um, which is one of my favourite novels about Manchester is, is a wonderful sort of alternative science fiction version of Manchester, although very kind of embedded in the real city as well. So his work can be found in various anthologies, including Closure, published in 2015, A Country to Call Home, 2017, and Seaside Special, 2018. And, and he also writes novels and poems. Um, he's been very modest about that, I think, in terms of his novels. So until recently, he ran a carnival band, which I'd love to hear more about. And he is, can be found here, but also online at petercarlu.com. So over to you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for a very kind introduction. Um, I'm going to read an extract from uh, the um, piece. I don't know whether to call it, you know, we've been calling it essays, um, we've been calling them, I don't know, stories. Uh, I, I really don't know what these things are. <laughs> we, but, uh, the label can be dealt with later. I'll just read it. It's called Bus Stop. We are the exhausted, the deluded, the drunk, the disappointed, the iced, the disheveled and the disorientated. We assemble at this urban installation of folded metal and sheet perspex in a collective act of summoning through the midnight mesh of supervening events, crashes, no-shows, roadblocks, breakdowns, other emergencies, the late, late bus out of the city centre. Cooks still in their filthed up whites, exhausted by shifts in baking heat, are now shuffling stiffly in the cool slap of winter air, hurdled eyes avoiding everybody. Aged, bleach, rowdied office cleaners, the empty purses and full heads stuffed with thoughts of a better life, at least for their grandchildren, headphones plugged in and nodding to a steady baseline of syncopated dirt. Young clubbers in their minimal threads, three of them clustered in a nearby doorway in a swirl of joking, hugging, heat and phone screen sharing. Now we notice at their feet, the brown-skinned girl slumped in the lap of the white boy, that this is no bother to anybody at the bus stop is the beauty of this moment in this time space of the Mancunian universe. 
Above the starless jolt sky, revealing itself as it never can do by daytime, in twists and flips of changing colour, doing kaleidoscopic variations on Degas, Chagall, Sarkarnam. Now some can omni blue, now aubergine black. I drink everything sky that taps you on your shoulder with its benign indifference. Passing along in the middle of the road to the taxi rank queue, go a fist of garrulous argumentative Rocky Horror Show devotees, loaded on goth eyeliner, lager and lyrics. This is the liminal space. Sorry, Danny Moran, if you're listening and I know you don't like that word. This is the liminal space. If liminal admits the possibility of some bare-chested youth coming around the corner twirling a scaffolding pole left as right and at the same time a distraught blonde wig woman in our pink cocktail dress stumbles clutching a pair of Cinderella ballroom shoes. Pity the rich, I suddenly find myself thinking. Those who can afford taxis might never experience the cinema of this street. We are social animals, and to be social in these circumstances, in these extremes of night, of exhaustion, of temperature, is to be in the rare crucible that creates perfect storms, one-off movies without a plot. Yeah, that's that. So, um, Sarah, how long did it take me to read that? It took you two minutes and 56 seconds. So you've right, got a couple okay. of things if you want to, <laughs> if you want to say okay. anything else. Great, I'll extemporise. So um, the, the, the the great thing I feel about about cities and about Manchester uh, and, and perhaps contrary to some of the vibes that, that occur in this in, in the collection re regarding the sense of anomie, of isolation, of, 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 of decay, is that at least for black folk, uh, the city actually is, is, can be quite liberatory in the sense that uh, the countryside is very much tied up with a, with a sense of a particular type of Englishness that excludes us uh, more fiercely, let's say, than, than the city. So the city, uh, insofar as it is in England, any place is ever welcoming, um, is more welcoming, certainly, in, in, in our experience of it than the countryside has been certainly in the past so that's why the pieces that i write tend to be more celebratory actually of the things that can happen and i thought i think you saw in the bus stop that that uh event where there's a young brown skinned girl slunk in the uh, arms really of, of of the white boy and it was like you know this is a beautiful moment you know and, and nobody gives a damn <laughs> and i think there's something beautiful about that so yeah i, I tend to be more celebratory of the of, of manchester uh, if, for that sense of inclusion that a city can bring than uh, uh looking towards its uh victorian and and slave trade past etc uh, i do that too but uh Maybe when I was writing these pieces, I was in that vibe of celebration. So that's 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 I hope what I've contributed a little bit to within the collection or the anthology. I'm probably Great. out of time now. Yeah. You're absolutely bang on five minutes. <laughs> well done, everyone. Um thank you, all of you. That's been really beautiful listening to. And it's actually, like you say, Paul, it feels like it's almost from another era now. And I've really missed Manchester these last well, this last year. Um, and just listening to you guys has made me miss it even more, um, but we'll get it back. Um, so we're going to just move now to questions and answers. I think Chris is going to, I don't know if he's going to pop up or appear or... I'm here, yeah. Um, Hello, Chris. I am. I'm here, yeah. Sorry, I, um, it was a brilliant talk. I really appreciate that. I've got a confession. My internet dropped out halfway through that talk and I went into a mild panic. Well, a huge panic. I thought the whole thing had crashed, but it came back on to see your faces back there and the talk going on was a wonderful experience for me. But yeah, we do have some questions. We have some questions have come in. Uh, and if anyone has any other questions, please raise them through the Q&A section. So the first one is uh, from Rhiannon, who's asked, uh, how did you narrow down the themes for the book? Uh, after, the, after all, there's so much to say about the city uh, and what it is or is presented to be. Uh, so if you could answer that, but just uh, as well, just talk about um, how you went from the initial idea through to this finished book, because uh, that's quite a journey. Do, do you want me to say a bit about I'm that? Just, yeah, go for it, Paul. Uh, OK, um, so I mean, I mean, I guess I I felt like I knew a few people who, who were writers about Manchester, um, but also I wanted to kind of put out a more general call. So I think I did it on Twitter and on, and on Facebook, the usual channels. 
just to ask if people were interested. And, and obviously it wasn't a paid project, so you were only, I mean, in a sense, um, I wasn't really offering anything in return, particularly apart from being in a book, I guess. Uh, but I was really, really surprised by the response. But also, um, I, I didn't impose really anything particularly on people. So I wanted people, to, so I asked people to choose a particular word that they thought kind of expressed something about their own relationship with the city. Um, and maybe, and some people cho chose three, so I think I initially said three, and some people had four, some people had three, uh, a few others had two, and, and a couple just had one. So there was a sense of kind of um, openness about that. Um, and what really surprised me is that from the 60 pieces we got, there was almost no overlap at all. And I still can't really explain that. I think it's maybe to do with the fact that I wasn't imposing anything, that there, people felt more free to talk more personally, perhaps about their experiences, but also that it just seemed to reflect the kind of diversity that I was really looking for. I also made a decision that I really wanted quite a strict male-female ratio because I felt, I, I mean, I might be wrong about this, but I did feel that a lot of the writing on Manchester, particularly the stuff you just see in uh, in all the bookshops, it's all written by men. And it, I just found out, like, this is would not be acceptable in London. <laughs> just wouldn't be an acceptable situation. And, and whether men write well or badly about Manchester, they're going to have a certain bias. So it was really important to me to get try and get that, that balance. And, and if anything, it should have been more female writers, just to rebalance it a bit. But I'm, I'm really proud that we did get a 50-50 balance. That was really important. I was also trying to get more diversity as well. I know Pete's talked a bit about his love of the city, partly from being black and feeling welcome from that respect uh, and, and contrast to the countryside. I think that's really significant. And I would want, I would want more of that. I think there are real issues about um, both confidence from people writing from minority backgrounds, but also actually being able to publish. You know, the publishing market is so skewed towards, well, it's skewed towards London for a start. So even books about Manchester um, are it's difficult to publish. Uh, but that, I think, also results in it being skewed towards a certain kind of demographic as well. Um, so I think there's much more work to be done there. And, and the book really only just started to try and do that. But the, the intention was there. Um, oh. Someone's singing. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was also just going to add a little bit about the theme. So um, I remember going to Paul's house to try and organise these 60 pieces into something. And I thought, God, this is going to take about 10 hours. And I turned up and Paul had kind of magically created these um themes that everything fitted into pretty much so um so i give paul all the credit for that kind of um organizational move but i think it's i really like it as a as a form i think it's quite a nice it's a book you can dip in and out of i think and you can kind of go to the words and the themes that kind of um speak to you at the point that you pick it up so thank you uh i've got a question now from simon a great question so Apart from the visual aspect of the city, uh, do the panel ever use touch, smell, or simply listen to the city? Do they ever travel through it with their eyes closed? Okay, more. Um, yes, is the quick answer. Um, I won't key you into it at great length, but um, every month we have a communal walk around Manchester, um, and very often they include. Um, very explicit sense walks. So for example, we've done smell walks based on the work of the brilliant Victoria Henshaw, who was at, in Manchester for a while. Um, also do lots of sound walks because it is a very good way of disorientating yourself. Um, there's lots wrong with psychogeography and it's another massively male field and I won't go down that rant, that's, that's gonna take too long. But for me, something that's really important is about how we connect with the senses in the city. Um, and I would say that most of my work is quite celebratory as well, because I think, I, I mean, I love the city and I love the opportunities. And to me, what's great about being in a city is that it is 
absolutely multi-sensory and kinesthetic and being guided by your um, heart or your nose or your guts or your touch or whatever is uh, one of the best ways to explore it. So I do that a lot and I massively actively encourage other people to do that. And um, I don't want to start advertising my work, but first Sunday of every month, we still do it even in lockdown, although we're kind of more connected digitally, which is a shame because I miss those sensations and I miss the point at the end where we share the stories. But it's still really important to keep in touch with those. Um, the thing I've been very bad at actually is tasting the city in a walk because even before COVID, getting people to lick walls wasn't the best um, safe thing. Uh, but um, we've done little bits on that, um, lots of edible um, models of the city and such like. So um, short one, yeah, excellent question. I'll shut up now, but if anyone wants to know more about that stuff, I'm happy to talk about it for a long time. Uh, I would always, I would also say yes, uh, Simon. Um, one of the reasons why I took to walk in the streets of Manchester, Salford and, and Greater Manchester actually for a lot of years at night was because it places less emphasis on the visual and all the other multi-sensory experiences. So it's something I enjoy a great deal as well. You know, it's a, it's a wonderful city to experience in many different ways. I was going to say about a couple of really, so smells are, I think particularly smell, smell has a, has a very strong relationship to memory. So actually probably a stronger relationship than the visual, in fact. So one of the smells, which is about where I live, is the McVitie's factory uh, on the long site Heaton Chapel border. And that creates its own kind of specific sense of place, I think sense of belonging when you when you smell that smell you know you're home yeah and it's and it's it's really powerful the other smell which i found really more disturbing was the smell of smoke after the moorland fires in 2018 um, so i went for a couple of walks around about then because really taking advantage of the, the the wonderful weather but that the the smell of that smoke lingered for days and days all across the eastern part of the city and it remind, I think it reminds us that we are connected to what's outside of the city very, very um, directly. Uh, and these kinds of things, although they're very unpleasant, they remind us of these bigger connections, which I think things like smell have, have the capacity to do that. That's a, that's a lovely idea. <laughs> Sorry, no, it's a lovely idea to, uh, I don't know if anyone's done it, I've not read through the entire anthology, but does somebody, has anybody done a story that is only the smell of Manchester or the smells of Manchester, a kind of <laughs> nasal tour? Maybe that's oh, a uh, Pete's uh, a piece on sewers, I think, is, is quite smelly, isn't it? It has to be. <laughs> I was also going to mention... Go on, sorry, sure. sorry, I was going to mention there's a piece called Feel by um, Sean Mills, and he's talking about the vibrations and the, um, so the sensations of the city. So that's one piece that kind of explicitly um, connects with that as well. Thank you. So, uh, oh, sorry, I was going to say, sorry, Bob. So I guess that's one, another part of the diversity. I mean, a, a book cannot be reflect the diversity of a city. It's, it's a stupid thing to try and do. Um, but I think it can it can do can kind of try and it can make an attempt. I guess I mean maybe they're all it's all always going to be a failure, but making the attempt is perhaps the the uh, the key thing. I suppose so, yeah, we've had a couple of responses. So Simon came back and just said he was in the Irk Valley this evening, and the sense of the Irk followed me all the way. The distorted freshness and the acoustics of that space were extraordinary. Um, also, Morag, a few people have asked whether you can share the links to the walk, whether that's possible, whether people can get that information. Oh, yeah. Um, if I could remember my own um, details. Oh. Yeah, um, the email, so the website is um, the LRM.org. And if you do Twitter, we're on at the LRM or people can email me um, at mlrose at the LRM.org. I think that's right if not I think if you google pink haired wandering something or other in Manchester you'll probably find me um or psychogeographical Manchester or something yeah that's all right mm -hmm. uh, so I've got, I've got a question from Paul um it's lovely to see some familiar faces and some new ones too 
My question to all panellists, uh, excluding, excluding your own works, uh, what's the representation of Manchester, cinematic, musical or prose fictional, that you'd most recommend? Off the map or overlook gems, particularly welcome. Is it? Is it? Is it for all of us? Yeah. Yeah, you can go around and uh, I'm happy for uh, everyone. Um. Oh dear. Um. <laughs> that's too hard. I hate questions. Too hard. <laughs> uh, so, all right, a film. A film would be a taste of honey. 1962, is it? Uh, I still go back to that. It's still like, it's got such such richness, and it's so relevant today as well. Still, so, and it's it's really old, but it feels very contemporary. Uh, a book is is Verbs by Jeff Noon. I I can't think of a more original book on uh, of, of any kind of genre. It's just unclassifiable but an extraordinary sort of feel of Manchester in the 90s that isn't cliched at all. It, it's just, it's filtered through something. I don't know what you'd have to ask Jeff. But that book to me, I think, is one of the finest pieces of writing about, about Manchester. Anyone else want to come in with uh, recommendations for works on Manchester? Yeah. Go on then. I will just because um, I went for a walk today with a friend who's about to move to Berlin and was talking about Manchester artists, so it's fresh in my mind. Um, I think my favourite Manchester visual artist probably is um, David Donico, and I totally recommend his work, um, partly because we share very similar obsessions, but he um, presents them in a visual way that I could not imagine. I think um, he's astonishing. Um, I think musically, probably Lone Lady, and again, I think probably people know her, or Kirsty McGee. Um, I think there's a lot of people that I should name now that I'm going to offend by um, forgetting, so I'll stop at that one. But, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Are we going left to right on our screens, in which case it'll be Nick next? <laughs> that was that to answer. <laughs> happy to speak that's fine well uh paul paul stole my idea of vert by jeff noon so uh, i'm actually a bit more recent and um i'm not a big reader of crime uh, novels actually but uh, a few that have stuck with me are the writings of joseph knox and particularly his debut novel uh, sirens uh so uh, you may want to check that out it's quite interesting it's about a, a young policeman who's been disgraced and uh, stalks the streets of Manchester and Salford. Um, musically, a fantastic band called Lines, um, who sort of I uh, knew in former lives when they were hooker, um, but again, um, sort of really important sound uh, within Manchester. And then films, I don't know. I mean, it's not the most pleasant film to watch, but there is something about Mike Lee's Naked um, that draws me and starts at least in Manchester. And there's something in that film that I always associate with the city, but um, it's um, not the easiest viewing, perhaps, especially uh, more recent times and movements that have changed, perhaps. But. Okay. Um, well, you know, we're, Manchester's blessed with so many great writers and so many great books set in it. Um, for me, the, one of the greatest Mancunians writers is Colleen Smith. Uh, and she's written a number of uh, crime thrillers, uh, Moss Eyed Massive, uh, Full Crew, a few others. And uh, I think I think she also, if she ever wanted to, she could turn her hand to Coronation Street and stuff because she's the very page turny and they've really brilliantly constructed plots. They're always cliffhangers every end of every chapter. Um, Joe Pemberton uh, for a different take, a different, a less realist take on 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 um, life in Manchester, uh, and uh, if yeah, I, I say this because uh, you know it, I, I edited this book, but I still think it's uh, despite that personal connection, I, it's still one of the best books about Manchester. Low Life by Mike Duff, which is a phenomenal book, and uh, perhaps the only book I've read that that that's that is not just about working class life, but it reads like it was written by a working class person. There are many books about Manchester that have this kind of 
middle class vibe to them, uh, where you can feel that they're kind of tourists. Uh, they they don't know this life, but they're trying to 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 imagine it, and they do the imagination thing well. But you know, Mike's just in it. <laughs> he's just surrounded by it, but he's read so widely. He writes brilliantly. Um, on to film. You know what? We just saw. I think uh, Lovers Rock was just on TV uh, by by produced uh, as part of the Small Axe series, and I can remember um, the blues, the the blues clubs in 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 Moss Side where I used to go, and you you were, you were so tightly rammed in the room you couldn't move your arms. <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be dancing like so, um, and and that's it. So that's uh, Cotty Newland and um, um, Steve McQueen created that one, I believe, but. That's a great film. I know absolute beginners. I can say, I'll not ramble too much, but uh, it was Foot Patrol. I met Foot Patrol at 2 a.m. coming back. Uh, Foot Patrol was an amazing dance, Manchester dance uh, group from our, I think, late 80s, early 90s. And they were in absolute beginners. They, they supported David Bowie's film, Absolute Beginners. And uh, I just had that privilege. They did a performance for me, me alone at 2 a.m. on the edge of you because I recognized them. And it was so, so they just started moving me. Anyway, I um, where was I? Um, I better show up. <laughs> so I'm gonna, mine isn't a book, a film or um, music, but um, I was just looking today at um, a web project done by Kate Fells, who's a brilliant writer in Manchester, um, called Rainy City Stories, um, which was quite a long time ago now, I think maybe six, maybe ten years ago, um, but it's a lovely map of Manchester with lots of um, contributions from people all across Manchester. Um, and there's also another writer called Sarah Claire Condon, who does a lot of work in Manchester, and she's done a several projects now I think commissioning various Manchester writers to write um, about specific places in Manchester so I was involved in one for Didsbury Arts Festival um, and she also did one for Children Arts Festival and all that stuff's online so there's quite a lot of nice writing place specific writing happening around the um, edges and online as well. Thanks guys I feel like you've just written my Christmas list right there and uh, a few people have commented saying can we, can we, can we send these recommendations out on email please uh, we are recording this, so it will be sent around, obviously, on um, social media and whatnot afterwards. So, uh, and also, someone next one's got lines of excellence, so I've got to check out lines as well. Um, so, finally, I'm gonna, I know we've, we've got to wrap up in five minutes, so I'm going to ask one last question. So, if you've missed anybody, I do apologise. Uh, let me find this question. This will go around everybody. Um, two seconds. Right, so if you could only choose one or maybe two words to describe Manchester, what would they be? And I'm happy to, anyone who wants to jump in first. <laughs> We're leaving on a good one. I think they have to be opposites though. I think there's something about Manchester that just is like you hate, you love. Um, it's like, you know, it's like a, a sort of, um, you know, disheveled monster. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. Uh, but, so, you know, it's, 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 I don't think you can, you can use two words unless they're opposite words. Maybe. I'm going to go for energy, and that's going to be my word. Which could be good energy and bad energy, but you can take pick. Kaleidoscopic. Like that, that's good. Aggressive camp. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Like that. That's very good. Yeah. I'll give you, I'll give you salt. It's salt, you know. It's um, both the, the 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 bitterness of salt, the, the 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 it's the opposite of sugar, of course, slave trade salt. Um, but it's, it's also got a salience, you know. It's uh, it, 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 there's something about Manchester that adds to your life somehow. Whatever you're doing, go to Manchester, you'll do it better. But it's also extremely bad for you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's about right. It's true. <laughs> okay, so I think we'll, we'll uh, we're two minutes to go, but it's probably time to wrap up. So obviously, I just want to again say thank you to uh, the panel. Uh, it's been a really enjoyable talk, um, and, and also to everyone who's, uh, who's attended tonight um, and, and watched. Uh, thank you for for turning up. It's really appreciative. Uh, like I said at the beginning, um, we are partnered with the People's History Museum Bookshop. 
the link will follow this. If you're interested in getting hold of the copy, I recommend buying it through through the bookshop. Um, but anyway, yeah, so I'll wrap up there. I just want to say thank you to everyone. Uh, appreciative. And uh, yeah, I hope you all have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for that blinking light. Is it still going? Coming right now. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Don't swear. Don't swear yet. Now you can swear. <laughs> no one swore. Well done. No. That was great. Thank you, guys. I think Thank Pete's the only, the only one that swears in the book, aren't you, Pete? <laughs> what? Which is good. It's got to have. I mean, yeah. No, I think it's really. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs>